at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Oh, we're now live. Someone's got some big echoes going on in the background. Um, welcome, everyone, to our very special XY Live Forum. Um, we're really excited. So we'll just wait uh, a little bit of time um, while people kind of fill in. Um, but just while I've got everyone on the panel, how is everyone's week been so far? Short. Great. <laughs> short week. Three oh, short yeah. weeks in a row. What do we do for Easter? Ray J, what did you get up to? I, I was lucky enough to get my hands on some cheap flights and accommodation to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> wow. um, it, uh, eight hours uh, for a travel for uh, three nights away is ridiculous. So I tried to beat the price locally and I couldn't do it. So I found myself on an AirAsia flight to, to KL. It was really, really cool. Awesome. It looked like there was a lucky lady involved as well, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll... Uh, I'll keep my my words to myself having this session recorded. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> How good is um, professional and personal just joining together on Facebook these days? It's, uh, it's <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> just don't just don't be a douchebag and, and you're fine is, is my theory. Absolutely. How about yourself, Adrian? What did you get up to over the weekend? <laughs> uh, well, I don't have the alibi feel that I was playing with my three daughters and we went to the park and that sort of thing. Um, I was just keeping my mouth shut. Uh... <laughs> All right, cool. Adrian, I don't think we want to hear about your weekend. Uh, <laughs> speaking about not being a douchebag, let's get started. Let's get stuck into it. So today... We've got XY Life Forum, this is our second one. So we are still working out how we're doing it um, and we really keen to get uh, the community involved. So every six weeks, we're gonna run one of these and get different faces involved. So it's not just gonna be the same old boring faces like mine. Just wanna start off by saying thanks heaps to AIA for supporting XY Life. Um, and today we're talking about how you started your business. There's been a lot of traction on Facebook in the Facebook group. Uh, about starting a business, uh, what the process is, how people have found it. So we thought we'd do a forum session uh, just to really nut it out and, and get real about you know how people have started. So I'm not going to intro everyone. I want uh, you to introduce yourself. So we'll start with Ray J. What yeah, sure. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Ray Jaramus. I'm actually an employee of uh, Traster Financial Life Management. So I'm... I'm uh, I think the only the only panelist that isn't uh, self-employed. So I think today I'll, I'll play devil's advocate and perhaps ask questions about why you've opted for for the the self-employed route from a from an employee perspective. I think that might be um, might be an interesting way to to introduce or facilitate the the conversation. Awesome. All right, Adrian, introduce yourself. We know a bit about you, but let us know what what your deal is. Yeah, so I run AP Financial Solutions, single plan of practice. I've uh, been doing that for about four years now. And uh, I came, originally came through AP Horizons, and that's how things kicked off for me, which we can talk a bit more about after. Awesome. So, Dylan, fresh new face. Um, <laughs> I mean, people have seen you in the Facebook group, but give us an idea about your business and yourself. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Yeah, so guys, my name's Dylan Martin. I'm from Wollongong, uh, 90 minutes below Sydney. And basically, I joined the financial planning industry in December 2010, straight from university as a power planner. And essentially, I bought into the practice here in 2013. So I've been a partner and I've been running the business for the last four years. And our business is called Feel So Good Wealth Management. And we've had a few name changes over the years. But we're sticking with this one. We think it's a good fit for the younger um, client, uh, client base. Awesome. Next up, we've got Ronald. Introduce yourself, buddy. Hi, guys. Um, Ronald Pratt up here. Uh, so my business is RP Wealth Management. Um, and unlike a few of you guys, I set up or started my journey at MLC through the advisor program. So starting by giving general a little bit of advice over the phone. 
moved over to the ANZ aligned network under one path um, with the hopes of potentially buying into one of the practices uh, there in 2013. And uh, after that didn't happen for a few years, last year I made the dive and set up my own business, RP Wealth Management, in August. So went on holiday for about six weeks to Europe, which probably wasn't the best decision um, in terms of cash flow. But you know, the, the security of not having an income there is, I guess, what's pushing me to succeed and make sure that I've got that regular inflow coming in. Awesome. So today we're talking about, you know, how you started your business. So let's just go around. Um, I just want to know a bit more details about how you actually started your business uh, and what was the best and worst thing about your experience. So we'll start with you, uh, Patty. Um, so, yeah, I came through AMP Horizons, uh, which got me into, into advising, uh, taught me a lot. And got me in a position where I could be uh, sitting in front of clients and being an authorised representative, which is fantastic. Um, I guess you, you're asking about the best and the worst, Phil. Is that the... That, well, just give us a bit more idea about, like, you know, not everyone knows what AMP Horizons is and, and how you actually went from a program to starting your business. So how does that work? Hmm. Yeah, so I'd, I'd sort of been in financial services before and um, saw AMP Horizons, which was a program that AMPs run. Um, for a number of years, which allows advisors, um, people that don't have experience um, advising and gets them into a position through an intensive training program to be an authorised representative. And um, historically that's been to either go into their own practice or to work in, an, in another existing practice. So trained up, ready to go, get out there and um, uh, change, change lives. <laughs> for the better or worse, uh, depends on who you talk to. Um, I, I came out of that and um, it was it was a bloody interesting journey. It was it was exciting, it was scary, it was um, it was fulfilling and painful at, at many points as well. So So what was the number one best thing and the worst thing about it? Um, the best thing was having your own business. You had your own business card and you could say it was my business. Um, like, so if you're talking to the business, you're talking to me, that sort of thing. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, that wore off after a while, Dylan. So just um, <laughs> if you're thinking about it. Um, and then the worst thing is having your own business because um, you live and die by your own sword. <laughs> so there's a lot of things you learn about yourself. You learn about what's required to run a business. And you realize um, there's a lot more to it than um, as much as you can plan and prepare for it. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, which um, I'm sure Ronald can. I'm sort of down down the other end of the the spectrum at the moment because I've been doing it for a few years, and Phil is as well. But it'll be interesting to hear what Ronald has to say. Uh, just being being a lot fresher. But um, yeah, it's it's the best and the worst part of it. <laughs> yeah, right. awesome. So we do, we want this session to be as interactive as possible. So I'd love for everyone who's watching, if you can just write in the chat box, if you're self-employed advisor or what position uh, you have, um, just so we can kind of get a sense of, of who we're talking to, that'd be awesome. So off to Ronald, I'd love to hear your story. So how did you start your business uh, and what, what's been the best thing so far and what's been the worst thing so far? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, I guess when I initially started financial advice, there was, I did not think about wanting to set up my own business. My whole intention was to be a good financial advisor, focus on the financial advice side of things and potentially buy into a, into a business where you've got the directors handling the day-to-day -day, uh, logistics of the business, payroll, GST, you know, marketing, those type of things. I guess once you become a business owner, 40% of what you do is actually giving financial advice. Everything else, you've got to be the social media expert, you've got to be the marketer, you've got to be the accountant, you've got to do all these things. So really financial planning is just one part of a, a whole picture. So I guess when I start, when I left MLC and then I moved into the One Path channel, I just wanted to be a great advisor and have a great salary and you know be rewarded as well. Um, things changed where we got made redundant and that's where I had the opportunity to go to an existing boutique practice um, with the whole intention of buying in. In 2013, the practice that I was at, which was in Parramatta, had eight advisors. Up until last week, they've got two advisors left. They went from 3,000... 
from eight advisors to two advisors. Eight. Yeah, from 3,000 clients to 2,000 clients. So instead of growing the business, they've gone backwards. And a lot of advisors have come in and left. So you know, we, I didn't really have a say in who got hired and who left. I had four assistants within 18 months. So every time I introduced my assistant to a client, you know, by the time they came back in, they were introduced to someone else. So there was a lot of um, employee movement. And at the end of the day, I always had someone to blame or someone to put that focus on. So it was never, you know, I just focused on what I did and the business was running itself. It got to a point in about 2000, end of 2016, where I just, I guess I said I had enough where I lost focus on why I was an advisor. So I was becoming more of a salesman. Under the ANZ Aligned Network, you're pretty much trying to sell products that are linked to the, to the bank. So you're not focusing on a strategy, you're focusing on trying to get that product to fit into the strategy. Whereas now I'm linked to a dealer group that's not with one of the big banks that has an open architecture to APL. So uh, going back to uh, 2016, so that's when I started looking at setting up my own business. And I'm, I'm always one to kind of hold someone's hand and make that jump. I'm never one to go into it myself. So I was going to, going to start a business with an existing advisor, but he was about 35 years old. He had three children, wife wasn't working. So he stepped into an existing business. And I said, look, am I going to still do this or am I just going to you know, jump into the deep end? So I made the decision to jump into the deep end and start up my own business. So much like Adrian, I'm a one-man band at the moment, but I chose a licensee that does all my back office support, does my marketing, helps me with um, the, the property side of things. I guess in Australia, clients love property, and I'm not a property expert by any means. So I like to know that I've got the backing of the licensee that's going to be able to handle that type of stuff. So with the self-managed super fund property um, advice, so it's great from a, a point of view where I'm starting the business and I don't have to worry about getting tied up with those little things, with doing questionnaires. I guess the research and everything else falls on me, but the little things fall on the licensee. And yes, I do pay a bigger cost than most people do, but it's good to have that, um, I guess, the compliance backing, the licensee backing when you're starting your own business. Awesome. Ronald, what... What's been the best and worst thing about the way that you've done it? Yeah. So uh, going back to your uh, to that, um, in terms of yeah, it's it's been a roller coaster. I'm not saying it's easy. It is. Some days you sit there going, "What the hell have I done? Like, why did I leave such a good salary and a good client base and go out and do this on my own?" But like Adrian said, you know, it's, it's only your own business. This is you. When you go out to a networking partner, when you go out to an accountant or a mortgage broker and you're talking about what you can do for their clients, you're telling them in real time what you can do. You don't have to worry about going back to a director and saying, can I do this? I promise this. What you're promising is what you can deliver. So at the end of the day, it's, it's your name. But at the same time, I guess you can never do enough networking from when you do make that step to go out. Now you can network, network, network and have all these people promise you that they're going to be able to send you leads and be able to send you business. But once you step out, you know, you're know you going to see that those leads that were promised aren't going to happen straight away. You've got to continuously network. So a lot of what I'm doing is I'm very community focused. So I'm part of the local BNI group as an insurance expert. Um, so uh, that's one of the good things that I did was getting into the community because I guess the area that I'm focused on, it isn't one of the big cities. So it's out in Western Sydney, but it's an area that in the next five to 10 years, I feel like is going to be the next Parramatta. So I'm not worried about the next 12 months. I'm focused on the, I guess, the long-term side of things, just like I focus with my clients. So I guess um, the networking thing and the relationships that I've formed have helped me greatly to bring in um, business and build those relationships. Um, in awesome. Of the and Ronald, I'm going to have to cut you off. We'll go to Dylan now. Dylan, what? Uh, how would you start your business? How would you get into it? And what was the best and worst thing about your experience? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, um, thanks for sharing that, Ronald. There's some great insights in there for sure. Look, uh, basically, when I had my my first and second interview uh, with with my now business partner back then was the director of the firm. Uh, I was still at university. I was just about to uh, 
basically a, approached my final exams. And in the second interview, he, he was obviously looking for someone to come on board, but he mentioned that ideally he'd love for someone to come on board with the, I guess, the vision for someone to take over at one point. And, and in the meeting, I, I, sort of, I sort of sort of nodded my head and said, oh, yeah, mm-hmm, but I didn't think much of it. But as time went along and as, as, as my, uh, my work developed and my skills developed, I sort of took an interest to that idea and actually buying into the business. And so basically from, from that moment on, um, December 2010 all the way up to July 2013, um, the plans and the conversations evolved between me and um, my business partner and uh, we agreed and we, we put together a plan and I, I essentially bought into the practice. Um, I bought in, I can't, I can't recall the amount now, I think it was uh, 30% at the time. And that was challenging because at that time I had, well, I had two kids and another one on the way wasn't, wasn't long after that. We had another one on the way. My wife wasn't working. We had no property assets, just renting. So it was very challenging and it was very, I guess, mission impossible, but we made it work. Um, we, we actually did some vendor financing. Um, which is pretty common in the industry. I'm not sure how common it is these days, but we did some vendor financing, which was very, very good. And and that's how I got into the into being a partner here. And as the as time goes on and as things progress, I'm, I guess I'm trying to buy in more and more over time. And you can see that plan coming to fruition. Mm. That yeah, makes awesome. sense? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's good. What what's been the the best way? So so you bought into the practice. Um, what do you think the best thing about uh, that kind of way of of owning a business has been? And what do you think one of the worst uh, things has been? Uh, I'm not sure about this specific um, example, but just being self-employed in general and being a, an owner in a, in a financial planning business. Um, Adrian and Ron catching it as well. But probably the worst thing is just you know. <laughs> There's so much more that is involved than just giving advice and sitting in with clients. You know, we've got um, we've got one full time, one part time, and I think cash flow for me, if I had to pick one thing, it's cash flow. Just knowing that you may be a really profitable business, but your cash flow is everything. You know, um, and yeah, we get paid in arrears. You know, um, currently, and obviously we can we can do things to improve that. But you, you've got staff to pay, you've got super to pay, you've got the bas to pay, you've got the ATO to pay. You've got things to do and things to pay. So cash flow has been probably the, the, the most difficult thing of being self-employed mm. and that takes a lot of time to manage. The best thing, well, there's plenty of great things. And for me, it was the level of control and the level of creativity and the level of responsibility, responsibility that I could take on. And I really crave that responsibility. And um, I think the pride, the, the, the pride in building something special, even though the, the business is, um, has been established and been around for, 20 nearly 25 years just looking at it's it's how it's structured historically and trying to sort of refresh or rebrand or just give that a bit of a, a bit of a lift up and and change direction slightly that's been really really the best thing about jumping in and, and becoming a partner awesome so ray j you don't uh own the business um but you went through amp horizon so i'd love to get your feedback um as to why you chose the path that you chose yeah, sure. Most certainly. So um, I came through basically at the same time as, as Adrian um, and AMP have a model where after your 12 month induction program into the industry, you've got the option to either uh, vendor finance a, a book uh, through, a, through a loan that AMP finance at, a, at I think uh, near on 100%. So the, the barrier the barrier to entry is relatively low if, if you're minded to, to take, take on that. Uh, or the alternative is a, a placement into a into a, an aligned business. Um, I mean, my I, at the time I was what, 20, 24 years old, and uh, my parents own own a business, and I've I've always been around small business and loved the idea of being a small business owner. Um, I think I think perhaps the apprehension is um, not knowing what I don't know. You know, after twelve months into the industry, I was still learning the discipline of a financial planner. And I think it's healthy to have a distinction between uh, a capacity as a financial planner and your capacity as a business owner. I think all too often, and we see this a lot in um, institutions with management, you know, if you're, if you're good at a job, you'll move up through the ranks, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're a, a necessarily the right person to manage people 
about how to how to do that that particular role. So I think I think one of the things I bided my time a little bit and, and thought I, I, there, was, there was perhaps a little bit little bit more to learn. Um, and and there's there's an honest element to that as well, where you know it's pretty pretty fearful. You know, I've, I've, there's there's some some risk aversion where um, you know the the surety of of uh, a, a payment on the fifteenth of every month is is pretty powerful. Um, and, and when the unknown is is so large, I, I wasn't sure that I was I was on the the side of the equation where it made sense to to, to have autonomy because perhaps I didn't quite understand what autonomy went, meant at that time. Hmm. And what and what's been the best thing about being an employed advisor, and what's the worst, knowing that your boss is probably going to watch this recording? <laughs> um, I think I think the, the worst the worst thing of, of being an employee is um, you know to uh, you you do have autonomy um, you know but but you're obviously you're you're running you're running uh, on somebody else's field, um, and you just need to make sure that yeah, your your personal alignment is as close to that that as possible. Um, that said, you know, there is a process to go through, like, like Ronald was talking about earlier, where you, you go through a process before you can uh, execute or, or make promises to clients and, and the like. Um, so that, that is probably not, not the worst thing, but it's, 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 it's a consideration. So if you're, if you're someone who's got strong beliefs or views as to how things are done, I think you need to um, recognize that as an employer, you're not responsible for the financial performance of the business directly. So there's an element there where you need to um, you need to work work within somebody else's framework mm. and the best thing is learning what I don't know you know um, I've got I've got an opportunity in as an employee to um, understand the business model learn in a safe space work in an environment where where the business financials are, are, are quite successful relative to the industry so I can I can learn a lot of best practice so that in the future should I make a decision to um, to to do something else, be, be it here or, or where wherever, then then I'm I'm really well placed to make that a, an informed decision. Awesome. So we've got a last minute addition. Um, Amanda Pond is joined in. Um, we'd love to. You just on mute. Um, but the first thing is introduce yourself and let us know how you got started in business and what was the best and worst thing. So there's three things I just threw at you. A financial planner for three and a half years before I started. You, Amanda, sorry, I'm just going to have to quickly say something. You're very quiet. Um, I don't know if we can turn your your uh, inbound up. Is that yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, so I, so I'd been a financial planner for three and a half years when I started the practice. I was working with another financial planner within the same licensee. And for me, I got into finance, I suppose I fell into financial planning. I originally started in administration working with a practice and I'd been working in the industry for eight years. And my boss at the time, he was more, he'd got into the industry for the money. So I suppose what his objectives were in business and what my objectives were in business were very within the line. So we clashed a lot. Um, and I suppose three months before I started my business, I had somebody, I was in a cranky mood this particular day and a, another businessman said to me, why aren't you doing it for yourself? And my response was, I couldn't afford to. And he asked me what it would cost to actually start out. And I shamefully re responded with, I had no idea. So here I am, a financial planner, who ultimately my job is to actually guide clients to actually achieve their goals. But yet a dream that I had in the back of my mind was to start a business, but I'd never done the research as to what it would take. So as a result of that, I realized my fault and went and did the research and three months later started my own practice. Um, I very much like um, Adrian and Phil, I, I sort of took a PSO offer through AMP, but I didn't go through Horizons or anything like that. 100% um, finance to start with. And I made sure that I had one year of drawing for my salary available in redraw across different um, loans. So before I started the business, I went and refinanced my home loan. I made sure that I had a couple of different um, lines of credits, et cetera, available to make that feasible. Um, 
then once I started the business, it took six months before my actual, um, I'd, I'd purchased um, about 225,000 worth of clients and it took six months before that come in. So the very first six months of business was quite um, cash flow wise, was quite testy. Um, but, and, and I suppose probably the whole time being in business is uh, exactly what Dylan said, cash flow is the biggest thing to manage because it's, it's often six months before you're getting paid from a client that you started working with six months ago or 12 months ago. Um, and it's something you don't think about as an employed planner. Um, so I've had my business now for five years and I'm in the midst of doing another acquisition because the hardest thing for me in business is the fact that I, I'm doing everything myself. Um, and the changes to bid and compliance in the last five years since I started the business has, has very much wiped a lot of the profit away from small practices that are doing everything themselves. So I think that scaling for me personally is the only option for me to actually ensure that I can actually bring in some help and, and maintain my profitability, particularly with probably a lot of the changes in underwriting and being able to get risk through as easy as well. Um, given the changes in the last couple of years to, to risk, which that was a heavy part of my business, which now it's only about 50% that I'm doing risk. Awesome. So what's, what's been the best and worst thing about it? Uh, the best thing is the fact that I've had the flexibility to do things differently, not to be a traditional financial planner, to be able to... Um, I, I, do, I, I design my own cash flow piece based on um, my gut instinct. I knew it would work and I was able to just run with it and trial it. Where if I was working with a practice, they probably wouldn't have had the same vision or had the, the belief in it to actually test it. Um, so, yeah, having that flexibility to just run with your own ideas and the way you want to do things as opposed to sticking to the traditional method of financial planning. Um, worst part, um, cash flow, um, the stress of it all, um, trying to do everything yourself. Um, I'll be completely honest with you all. Um, I pretty much had a breakdown before Christmas, um, ended up with eight weeks off work. Um, and it wasn't the stress that did it to me. It was actually my um, subconscious in which I ended up with um, – my arm having my clonic jerks all because I pretty much went six weeks straight of doing four hours sleep a night and working weekends. So mm. my body just went, well, if you're not going to let yourself relax, we're going to make you. So I suppose that's probably from a self-employed perspective, you, you don't have the flexibility to just walk out the door. Um, you've got to get stuff done. Um, and yeah, that's, that's probably the hardest thing from a self-employed perspective of the hours that you put in trying to find work-life balance. Mm. All right. Well, because we all like talking about ourselves, I'll tell you my story. Um, and I certainly love talking about myself. So I started out as a planner working for an advisor and we had a, a kind of a five-year plan um, that I would uh, eventually take over and he would leave the industry. Uh, that got shortcutted uh, to about a year and a half. And so I um, took over an existing client base. Um, so I vendor finance uh, a portion of it and also was able to uh, borrow some money off my father-in-law. Um, so that's how I got started. I, that was back in 2012, I think. Um, I'm getting a bit older, so so years kind of disappear on me. Um, the the best thing about it, um, you know, the, Dylan and and Ron and Adrian did touch on it. It it is a big ego boost. Um, let's let's be honest. Running your own business, you you feel like a big dog until you realise you've got to actually pay for it. Um, and it, then it becomes a bit harder. Um, but but for me, the best thing about it was the freedom to have um, being self-employed. Um, I didn't need to ask anyone to, to take time off and, and go down to my daughter's gymnastics and watch her. Um, I could I could do it um, when when I when I needed to. Um, you know, but but on the flip side, uh, the worst thing is it has you know been it is stressful uh, for me. Um, you know, yeah, as as the guys have already said, you know. 
you are looking at doing everything in, within the business. Um, and, you know, now I'm five years on, I, I'm allowed to outsource a lot more stuff. So, so it becomes a lot less stress and, and a lot less kind of all on me. But um, that's probably been, yeah, the hardest thing for me is just you, you are, um, especially at the start, you're, you're all in, you're, you're only thinking about the business. Um, so that's kind of my story. Um, but I think, I think a big um, question when starting a business, uh, and Dean Holmes has actually asked the question. Um, so we'll go around. I'd love to get a bit more details and, and share as much as you want. Um, I'd love you to share all your numbers, um, but obviously this is being recorded, so be as comfortable as you want. But uh, how did you finance it? What, what was the deal? So uh, a few people bought in, 100% finance, love to know, kind of wrap some numbers around it. Uh, and Ron, you've, you've gone out from scratch. Uh, how, how did you manage that? What kind of um, numbers were you thinking when, when you started? And, and as well with yourself, Amanda. So we'll start off with, we'll go to Paddy. Um, how, how was the deal structured? How did it all work? Yeah, pretty much um, you're on the hook for the whole client base. So any clients that leave, you're committed to the debt and um, it's your responsibility to keep them engaged um, and generate value out of that book. How, um, how is the value calculated, Adrian? When you say the debt and it's deal of, and it's, it's um, vendor finance, how, how does that number get articulated? Yeah, so it's a multiple of uh, the revenue, um, and depending what's the on multiple number, Patty. What's <laughs> the multiple number? So with AMP, it's uh, it's four times. Um, I guess the the flip side of that because most people go well, the market rate is two, two and a half, three if it's an amazing business. Um, generally, the reason why it is that within AMP is that they've got to guarantee that they'll buy it back from you. So if you shut your business down. Um, they'll pay back what the book's worth or what your book of clients is worth. They'll give you a, a payout that's four times the ongoing revenue. So that's, that's the sort of, um, that's the backdrop and the, I guess it's a bit of a safety net in terms of um, the valuation of the book that you, you're going in, in that, that amount. Um, the value generated in the book um, then gets that amount as well. So um, the flip side is, is when you're starting, um, you're paying a lot more than the market rate for a client base. Uh, but um, as you as you go on and you, you extend your networks and your um, referrals and people that aren't from, um, from the book, uh, you, you start to generate a, a, a higher amount of value in the, in the uh, okay. business. Patty, um just because I know you're, you're a fairly open guy and, and um, I'm happy to ask you these questions. Um, what revenue did you buy at four times? So did you buy at 15 grand? Did you buy at a hundred grand? Do A&P dictate how much they sell to you? Or do you say, look, I want 200 K of, of annual uh, recurring revenue. Yeah. So the practice startup offer, it's, it's, it's a standard package that's been in place. Um, it's changed a bit over the years. When I bought my business, it was, um, it was about 55 to 60, uh, thousand ongoing revenue. Um, but then when you've got, when you factor in that, that equates to about 240, um, thousand capital value, um, in that framework, the, the interest payments work out to be um, if they're around 7% of that overall amount. So almost half is getting taken up by um, interest payments. So you've got that net, you've got about a net 30,000 coming in, which arguably, um, like, I guess, I guess everyone sort of understands what it costs to run a good financial advice firm. Um, you don't have a lot of resources to work with there. You, you're very dependent on what's coming in the door uh, initially. So I guess, like, I might I might tie it in in terms of, um, like, it's really good. I know Phil wants to explore the valuation bit, but just drawing parallel between uh, Ray and I over the last few years, I've, I'd, I'd be rocking up and um, I'd be like, oh, Ray, how's it going? Oh yeah, we've got like the support staff. We've got, it's great, it's great structure, really good business. Everything's already, um, the value proposition's really robust. It's been around for years. And I'll be like, oh, I'm still trying to work out what my value proposition is. Um, I don't have any staff or I do, and it's really hard to do both at the same time, manage staff and, and um, see clients, etc. And um, 
but then on the flip side, I'd be, he'd be like, um, maybe wanting to catch up. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm working from home today or <laughs> down the beach. Um, I thought I'd go for a swim this morning. I'm not in the city yet. Uh, so, but, um, and then we were getting beers and I might be, um, or I can't afford to, to buy the next round, Ray. He's like, oh, that's all right. I've got a regular income. So, um, I'll, I'll get, <laughs> that happens uh, too often. <laughs> <laughs> Ray wasn't waiting for the the payment cycle from AMP to to get paid, so okay. that, that's probably that's a good little juxtaposition. But um, I'll I'll let you get back to the the key question for Dean around. Um, let us stay on track. That's not your that's not your style, Paddy. <laughs> you yeah. get distracted a bit. Sure. <laughs> so if Ross has actually asked how much is it, how much do you think it would cost you to run a one man financial planning business? I know you do have staff in in your, your many. Um, businesses but uh what do you think patty as a, as a rough oh, number? these days i think it's it's not a great way to start a business sorry Ronald. um it's it's just really hard it's not um well how much do you think it costs patty the cost the cost base would be you'd want to have to to get a good financial business operating and say you planned all your processes and sort of how you want to do advice before um, which wasn't fully articulated because I was still learning how to be an advisor as I came out of Horizons. Um, so you've got everything in place, how you want to do things. You'd, it'd be reasonable to say you'd need at least um, $80,000 coming in. So you could cover, um, cover a support member and a bit of a buffer there for yourself. Um, that That's what I'd, I'd suggest. Um, Unless you unless you're really good at operating um, and you, you've got a great pipeline and you can um, you've got a good outsource support structure already in place. If you want to have a number of things in house, that's that's how much you. If you want to have someone supporting you and your own person, um, which enables and that's a whole other discussion in terms of outsourcing versus having your own person. But um, yeah, awesome, buddy. Thanks, yeah. mate. I'm keen, Ronald. keen. Um, yeah, Ronald. I think I think I, you know it'd be interesting to hear your views on this because it sounds like your model uh, into self-employment is probably a bit different to to the other guys. So keen, keen to to sort of get your views on on yeah cash flow for the first twelve months, considerations when you're funding this. Um, you know, rough numbers on on you know your cost base would be awesome if you were you were comfy doing that. Um, yeah, that that would be awesome. Yeah, definitely, and and unlike a, a lot of guys on the panel, so um, as you mentioned, I did start from scratch. So I looked into it initially, purchasing a book. I went to A and P. I went to a couple of the other guys, and the reason why I chose not to go into buying a book is that my last practice got burnt by um, buying a book. So basically, what what happened was, and this is where I was going to buy into the other business was, is that they bought a risk book off another advisor. The risk book was, I think, 100,000 reoccurring. Um, so they paid about, I think, I think they paid three times the value. But what happened is the, the risk advisor didn't tell his um, uh, referral partners that he was selling the book. So when he sold the book to our business, they were also clients of the book. So the first that they heard of um, the, the selling of the book was basically getting a letter saying, you have now changed over to Clarity Wealth this is your new advisor. So they thought, hang on, I've sent 10 clients over. They just started pulling all their clients out of the book and within about two or three months, 50% of the revenue had gone. So it went from $100,000 reoccurring revenue to down to 50,000 within the span of two months. And that just burnt me to think that, you know, I'm potentially buying someone else's problem or there could be issues, there could be a drop off rate. So I just thought, you know, back yourself. I know I'm a good advisor. I've, I've had that experience of being a financial advisor. Now I've just got to focus on being a good business owner. So, so Ronald, you a, 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 Ronald, when you were, yeah, when you were thinking about starting your business, did you say I need to have X amount of money in the bank? Yeah, so I, I probably didn't plan it as well as most people do. I took out a personal loan, so I took out about twenty thousand dollars. I had a bit of savings as well. I had about say $10,000 not locked up in anything where I could touch on and that kind of dwindled down a bit when I went to Europe and as I was on the last legs of the trip I started thinking yeah maybe I shouldn't have spent that much money but um, so I had I'd say I have had probably about three months worth of income available to me um, so for the and, and that's you're probably not going to get started getting paid for your first three months while you're trying to submit business and get paid out so 
the way it works is my dealer charges their um, licensee fees on a monthly basis. And because they do my um, uh, power cleaning and also they do my um, ad administration, they also take a percentage of my revenue. So everything that goes through on a monthly basis has a split. And I'm, you know, it is a large split. It's about 20% of all my revenue. But what I've got to do is after 12 months, really sit down there and, and then look at what I've paid to the dealer, what I've um, made in revenue, and if it's worthwhile to potentially get someone else into the business, like a junior advisor, that's, gonna, that's going to be able to do my administration as well as bring in some revenue into the business. I don't want to get an administration person because I want someone to also be able to bring in revenue. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank you, right. mate. That's, that's that's wonderful. I I was, I and perhaps for for Dylan and Amanda, this is something that uh, was touched on talking about multiples. Um, one of the things, as an employee, I I am uh, transparently, I guess, fearful of is, um, you know, the idea that regulation is changing so much around revenue streams that's attached to a multiple. So, um, you know, the the fear there, I guess, is that you you buy into a traditional revenue source. At, at a multiple, which which may may be um, at risk in the future, and and what what your thoughts are around that, or, or whether or not perhaps I, I don't know, maybe that's something that gets factored into the negotiations, and and you know that that starts to um, starts to impact the multiples. I'd I'd love um, you know as an employed advisor and for the employed advisors out there for for I guess your your views on 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 the regulatory change and and how that how that will impact the value of your business going forward. Do you want to go with me? Either or, but yeah, but either or, or yeah. Yeah, look, I'll just touch on a few points there. Um, so when when I purchased into the business in 2013, um, we basically looked at um, EBIT and also a multiple of recurring revenue. Uh, and, and just to give you guys an idea, at the time, I think, I can't exact, remember the exact number, it was between two and a half and three, um, maybe it was 2.9 or, or something like that. Uh, and so basically that's how we did it. And I think that, there's never any perfect way to work out what a business is valued. But to answer your question, I reckon from the last couple of years onwards, there's, there's never been a more confusing time of how to value a business because of regulatory change. Uh, you've got to factor in how technologically advanced a business is. Are they still using paper trails versus do they have really robust systems? So it's not just about the revenue. It's about what's, what's built in behind that revenue. So I think if I was to go out on my own these days or in three or four years time I think it'll be incredibly challenging and, and hats off to, to Ron and, and Amanda and those guys who have gone out uh, from scratch it's, it's a challenging environment I believe what, what are your thoughts and, on you know we, we talk a lot about multiples but I think EBIT's a pertinent one to, to understand as well so you know when you're buying into an existing business is is it important that you 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 think of EBIT perhaps as an opportunity to improve um, you know you talk about technology and those sorts of things so do you you sort of see see the the cost base of a business, um, uh, and that the fact that that's likely to reduce as scale st scale increases. So do you, do you do you see that as a as a as an opportunity to increase scale and margin, um, and that that kind of counters the risk on, on maybe paying a higher multiple against threatened revenue streams. Yeah, look, I'm not overly familiar with EBIT and, and how to crunch the numbers on EBIT. I mean, I know what it means broadly, but like to Mark, to answer your question, I, I really truthfully believe that if we were to run the business like with the revenue we had and the client base we had today versus say six years ago, our cost would be dramatically higher. Yeah. And it's not just because staff or humans are working smarter and are more tuned in. I think technology is one of them, better processes. And I think we've had a lot of talk on the group about outsourcing. And I know a lot of you guys do some really good outsourcing <laughs> exercises. I think that scalability and, and having a really robust business is going to be one of the better ways to, to thrive and not just survive. Um, yeah. And I'm a big fan of, um, you just mentioned, oh, you just mentioned, you mentioned um, oh, lost, lost my channel of thought now, but you mentioned, you're yeah, basically increasing your profit margin and running a really tight ship. And I think there's so many ways we can do that, you know, uh, coaching your clients that we don't use paper anymore. You know, we have video meetings or face-to-face -face meetings and we sign things on, on a, a, a tablet or DocuSign or whatever you use. There's, there's small ways you can increase your margins every year. It might be half a percent one year and 2%. And that's just by bringing expenses down without yeah. compromising on your service offering and your engagement.
So, yeah. And I think that I think that another big thing is that for me, my personal goal is to make a hundred percent of my clients ongoing clients. So paying a fee for service. Okay. I guess we're trying to um, look at ways to get bringing new clients and trying to you know build a service offering that's going to be lower cost. But the idea is that you want them to be sticky to your business as well. So. I've, I've, out of all the clients I've signed up, I've only had one client that's not on an ongoing service package. So mm. every client I try to, even if it's you know nine hundred dollars a year, so if you, somewhere in the fifty dollars a month range to all the way up to a, a platinum type of client that's paying you know a couple of hundred bucks a month, I try to make every client ongoing to make to show that value, and that's that's what's going to bring the value of your business up at the end of the day as well. And perhaps, perhaps, Ronald, is that is that a benefit of, of your model? I mean, you obviously accept the risk of uh, cash flow because you've not bought an income stream, but what you've got the opportunity to do is to create a, a revenue stream that isn't being looked at by the regulators. And, and in theory, perhaps you might find yourself in a position in a couple of years later with an asset that uh, demands a higher multiple because of the way you get paid. That's exactly right. So my clients, the, the way I'm bringing my clients in is focusing that they need ongoing advice. And my objective uh, for the first 12 months was just to get an ongoing revenue stream that's going to be able to pay my uh, licensee fees for the first 12 months. So I've already hit my 12-month target in eight months in terms of the ongoing revenue. So I just wanted to make sure that my licensee fee is paid so I don't have to worry about that. Then I can focus on bringing in more revenue to be able to pay for things such as advertising, you know, uh, potentially Facebook ads and things that are going to, anything that I do, I try to filter back into the business. Like I made a car purchase on the weekend. The first thing I want to do is go brand the car just to go get my name further out there in the community. So anything I do, I try to link back to my website, try to link back to everything and build a brand and build a following because at the end of the day, that's what's going to sell and that's what's going to bring up that multiple. It's not going to be worth two and a half times. It's going to be, Close to maybe four times. Yeah, wonderful. Really, really appreciate that. And perhaps just before we, we finish off, Phil, maybe Amanda, I'd I'd love love your thoughts on on the multiple and and you know yeah. the the considerations with the regulatory risk and all that sort of stuff. The stuff that scares me and is like, yeah, I'm thankful I've got that that payment on the fifteenth every month. Yeah, so right, I'm completely with you on that one because exactly what you're talking about is what I've been going through in the last twelve months with my business. Because although I did the original acquisition. Um, I don't, I personally don't believe that there's probably, given the compliance changes in the last five years, I, I personally don't believe I could have done it under the current environment five years ago with the level that I brought in at. I, it's too small, your overheads are too high and the amount of work that you're doing, um, you, 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 there's only so many hours that you can, and, and, and much time you can invest in your business yourself. And on that scale, there wasn't enough for me to actually bring in help. And then to be able to grow your business, you need to be able to afford to bring on help. Um, and that's where I'm stuck at the moment. Do I buy a business, another business, and, t and acquire another um, a book, or do I still try to battle on and do it myself? And for me, I look at, yeah, I take a risk of valuations and I'm changing because of compli uh, different regulatory changes. But that'll probably still be a good few years off. And in that time, you can utilise the income from that to actually bring on staff so that I can actually start focusing on bringing in the right client. Because at the moment, I'm five years into my business. Most of my business isn't from my business that I brought because I bought a dormant book. Um, and most of my business is all a new business. And I, I don't even have time to target what I brought because I don't have any um, I don't have time to target a lot more business. I could write a lot more business if I had help. So that ultimately comes down to I want the extra cash flow. I want extra help. The only way to do that was to guarantee that I've got that cash flow to actually support extra. Um, not the technical side. Just, just while you're in that space of looking at acquisitions, um, what what are you looking at in the market at the moment in terms of multiples? And so I'm so AMP. There's a lot of exiting planners with AMP at the moment due to valuation changes. Um, so I so put in perspective, I'm prepared to put out numbers. So I started my business um, with a valuation. I paid 225 for it, um, and it's valued at 470 at the moment. Um, five years later, and I'm looking at an acquisition of a business that's worth 300, 
which will increase my income by about another 70,000 a year, which will allow me to bring on the support. Um, the practice that I'm looking at buying, whilst it is a little bit um, further up than where, like probably about an hour from where I am, it's, it's only, I only really need to go once a fortnight to service the clients. And it's more about, I'll service the clients, but I'm not going to try and build my business there because I know I've got the capacity to build where I am a lot more. So you're looking at, sorry, I just, I just found the numbers. That's like a 4.2 um, times revenue in, in that uh, purchase, that a &P purchase? Uh, four times. Four times. Okay. Just a flat yeah. four. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. We, we are going to have to wrap up. We're, we're over time by five minutes. I think this has been a great discussion <laughs> about um, the, the, the complexities that is um, deciding how to start out in business. And, and you've got examples of people going through the you know, institutional uh, vendor finance route. Um, Dylan's gone through the uh, small boutique fi vendor finance. Myself, I did kind of a mixture of vendor financing and borrowing off family and friends. Uh, and Ronald's gone and started out um, on his own. So uh, as with anything in financial planning, there is kind of a breadth of, um, you know, different ways of, of skinning a cat. So I just want to thank everyone on the panel for, um, you know, being willing to share um, your experiences and being very open about it. So I just want to thank everyone for being on the panel and sharing. Pleasure. So just to finish off, I just need to remind everyone about the Facebook group. If you're not on the Facebook group, go to xyadvisor.com slash community, fill out a quick form. It's going to take you about 15 seconds to fill out the form. Uh, and then we'll send you an email with a link to the Facebook group. Uh, it's an amazing group where you can just ask any questions. Um, and it kind of does drive our, our conversations with the XY lives. Uh, if we see lots of traction on, on a certain topic, we'll try and kind of start to target uh, those type of topics on the XY Live. So it really does drive a lot of a lot of our conversations. So make sure you join in the Facebook group. And we also last week launched the Mastermind group. So it's about smaller groups of advisors coming together face-to-face, -face, uh, all virtual meetings, um, and just really being there to support each other. So XY Advisors is all about uh, helping advisors become modern advisors, uh, so we're kind of giving as much value as possible and kind of listening to the community and trying to provide what everyone's asking for. So make sure you join them. Uh, just thank you again to ARA for supporting XY Live. <laughs> happen. So just signing off. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and thanks for the panellists again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Bye.